So uh, we had awesome batch of best of Baltic startups last year. It was like seven companies presenting. And this, this part of the presentation is not about you know, competing for some kind of award, award or so on. You will have founders on the stage just telling how they are doing, what they are fighting with, what they're happy about. It will be a, a amazing session like it was last year. Um, and actually, you know, we might have pretty nice tradition coming out of this, this session. One of the companies um, that presented last year is already becoming a little bit of unicorn, unicornish. So keep eye on these ones and think who you believe might become unicorn next year. We hope we will have one from, from every year's session. But first we start, um, I'd be happy to give a kind of quick overview um, how the ecosystem looks like in Baltics. And I hope the slides will, uh, will come up um, soon as well. Anyone? Because, you know, some of the numbers and statistics, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to give it with, without slides. Sorry? Can you sing? Sing? Yeah, just sing a nice song. We have actually a perfect singer in our team. Um, so we always kind of shy when it comes to singing because he's so good. <laughs> good, thank you. There are a couple of items. We, we compare um, all three Baltic countries uh, what has happened in, in these countries during, during uh, last year. Um, and there are a couple of key takeaways, how the Baltic countries are like, very similar. In some ways, there is pretty weird statistics, particularly in terms of round sizes, what Estonian companies ask as a seed round and A round, and, and what Latvian and Lithuanian companies are asking. It is based on, um, partly on our own statistics, we, see, we have seen in the last um, two years roughly 2,000 companies all over Europe, and, and close to 20% of them are from Baltic countries. We have written down kind of all the statistics, how much money they are asking for, what is their status, and so on. So part of the statistics comes from, um, from, from our own databases. Otherwise, the whole Baltic scene um, comes from international databases, and we have we have bought in a couple of them to compare the notes. And they are incredibly similar in terms of the numbers, what they tell about um, uh, Baltic, Baltic startups. So uh, I wonder, um, is it so? That, OK, nice. Um, in total, when we compare the databases, there are roughly 1,000 450 startups that are recognized as startups from Baltic countries. Um, 670 from Estonia, 300 and 400 from, from Latvia and Lithuania. And uh, just to mention, these ones are which are domiciled, which headquarters, the legal entities are in these countries. Uh, for example, you don't include here TransferWise, which is domiciled in, in UK. So, um, they are just purely here right now, and uh, the number has been growing in amazing space. Uh, so so during, during the last 12 months, like 440 startups were added from Baltics. If you think about it, it's like 1.3 per day, right? So, and if you look at the population combined in Baltics, it's, it's pretty small. So, so that number of startups coming up, it just shows the kind of how active, how agile is, is the whole environment. Now, since 2010, um, we have the most precise crowdsourced database on fundraising. It cannot be better than, than crowdsourced one. 
And, and since 2010, uh, Baltic companies or companies who started or are Baltic related have raised uh, over 1 billion euros from investors. Of course, there are outliers. And again, you can imagine TransferWise doing major difference in, in, in 2016, 2017. Um, but there are over 41 companies who have raised more than 2 million. Already reasonable amounts for, for, for Western funds also to deploy. Now, activity has been really different um, if, if you look at the data. And again, some outliers making 2017 super good. Uh, but as we see, it's, it's growing year by year. Um, country by country, the activity is, is different, but, but it's all heading in, in the right direction. Now, I already learned that this slide is outdated, talking to some of the founders uh, today. Uh, there will be news coming up, hopefully very soon. Um, but what is really happy to see about the top list, it's, it's all over the Baltics. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Lithuania, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Estonia, and, and so on. Um, now, as I said before, one of the biggest things what, what have really happened is number of new funds. We can point out here super angels coming to market, um, open circle, change ventures, started very actively, already have done like six deals. Baltcap, who is most known for private equity, has entered into kind of growth stage. Uh, Trend Ventures, brand new fund looking at, uh, at, at Baltic companies, contrarian ventures. There is also uh, United Angels um, actively in the market. I didn't find them website yet, didn't find the logo, so imagine they are here as well. And, and a few funds coming, coming out more and exactly addressing the most critical phase the pre-seed and seed, what has been always lacking in, in, in this market. Of course, you know, there are a lot of international investors, but there is one point I wanted to make. So um, you see here actually quite a lot of US investors. And, um, and, and if you take the kind of initial bigger rounds from, from to startups in, from Baltic states, so, so um, they are mostly done by US investors. And, and looking at the relationship between Eastern Europe and Western Europe VCs, I would say US VCs have been way more active looking at Polish startups. And, uh, and we see right now actually more and more uh, funds coming in from, from London, from Germany, and so on. But for some reason, the connection between Baltic countries and the US has historically been, in terms of funding, uh, significantly better. On exits, uh, 30 trade sales since 2010. And um, maybe two things to point out what we have seen in terms of exits. Our focus is deep tech companies, companies who create you know, technologies which are really hard to copy. And we have seen that this type of companies, wherever they are, they get international strategic in kind of attention very fast. In the first, second year, they operate, they already have US strategic, learning more about um, Asia and, and European ones. European VCs tend to complain that there are not enough exits in Europe and, and strategics don't buy. If you're a deep tech company, technology is great, engineering base is great, um, you will have international attention very fast. And, and many of the companies over here, they have been sold maybe even too early because strategics have, have really wanted to buy them. If you like tech company, only traction sells. And the wider your customer base geographically, the better being like active only in Germany, being active only in London, or some of the European countries, don't bring you yet international attention enough. You need to be really, really wide. Um, in our own database, we have reviewed about um, 340 uh, startups uh, from Baltic countries. Um, Estonia, 169, Latvia, 87, Lithuania, 81. And, and maybe pointing out more like, you know, deal split by country on the left side. It seems like, you know, the seed we have seen more in, in Estonia than Latvia and Lithuania. A rounds equal amount of, uh, of startups in A rounds. But the amounts, what, what, the kind of deals, what we have proposed to, 
average investment ask on, on the right side, it's interesting. So pre-seed, Estonia and Latvia are asking quite equally. Lithuania, for some reason, substantially less. Um, seed, Estonia is asking significantly more. But A round is weird. For some, weird, some, some reason, Estonia startups are asking less than 2 million to, to make the A round. And Latvian and Lithuanian ones are more. Of course, it might be like too little data in some of the categories, but most of them have definitely uh, 10, 15 plus companies uh, in, 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 in the numbers. So we also have expanded our team. Uh, some of our new team members joined us um, early this year because there is so much to do. And you know, we are always happy to talk to you uh, whenever you have either idea, we are happy to meet early, or when you're raising, we, we are always happy to meet. So, but now to startups. And um, the first one uh, is pretty magic story. Um, I'll ask Karel from Verif to come up. And um, I would say it's even hard to believe. There will be a few questions coming up later. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Karel, and I'm from Verif. Verif is Stripe for online identity verification. We allow any website and mobile application to verify driver's license, passport, and government-issued ID. Nearly three years ago, when I started with this project, we tested different providers on the market, and we wanted to see how online businesses do the ID verification. Mainly, they were picture-based, and uh, they just asked to upload a copy of your ID. So you can see that uh, those pictures look alike. They're like similar, but actually only the picture, name, and date of birth are the same. All the other information is falsified using Photoshop, like uh, in the fake one. And we wanted to see how people can understand that there's something wrong or not. And this was the first lesson that we got, that pictures never do them justice. You really have to have more information, which will lead to secure identity verification. And even more, ID verification is essential for businesses to go online. And also, identity theft is also a growing business in a way, because there's so many people taking advantage of those things that pretending to be somebody else online is, is rather easy. And what we learned in this current stage, that we started in Estonia two and a half years ago, we focused on banks. While focusing on banks, we really felt good, like in a way that, OK, now we see that there's one person who is applying for a loan, but actually there's a fraudulent case. There's somebody else behind the camera. And what Verif can do, we can just save up 2,000 euros, honest people and companies' money. But uh, while moving to US, there are many marketplaces. And we noticed that if you're taking or if you're hiring a nanny for your children from one marketplace, then actually the need secure verification is even higher. It's there's no price tag on it. And it's all about trust online. And this is the reason why Verif is now transforming more into marketplaces and taking them as our core customers. So we created this product, like a unique approach of it. You just have to do and follow instructions given on the screen. And we do the rest. When we started in Estonia, we had a very high ambitions. And um, we noticed that the only way to fulfill our ambitions in Estonia is to verify every single Estonian twice a day. <laughs> you know, it, it, it won't work out as that. So uh, we started to scale and go to other markets. And it went big. Now we are. US company, together with Y Combinator, 
We have our headquarters now in San Francisco. And our mission is really to gain the trust of the internet, to build up trust and to make sure that the people have been honest with us. Also, like saving honest people's and companies money, and in the long term, to transform verif into verb. It was also great that uh, there was one Twitter post when our president Kersti met with Ashton Kutcher, and then in the end, there was a part of <laughs> mentioning verif as well. Yeah, now <laughs> most of our business is a bit far away from Estonia, but we definitely remain as an Estonian company. Our mission is always to fix things that don't work. There's so many things, and if you keep on fixing them, you need innovative solutions to fix them all. And if there are people who are up for fixing things that don't work in the best possible way, then um, there are some uh, plans. Because I had already this opportunity to be here, then, uh, then yeah, there's just one slide as well. And, and yeah, this is just a general story, how everything happened. If you'd like to know more, then um, take contact with us. There are going to be many big news coming up. And, and it's happy to remind you that there's a new verif in town. <laughs> Thanks. You have been kind of modest here. We, we, we met like many times before you head to the US and you had this product and the story was amazing and you tried to convince some local banks and, and maybe it went, maybe it didn't. So, and then you went to US uh, Y Combinator and, uh, and, and in Y Combinator's history you were the most sought after company, right? After you, you went through it. Um, how many investors wanted to talk to you? <laughs> Over 260 investors who emailed us, they followed us to the airport, yeah. they asked to invite And you made even us. me busy to reply to UK investors, why don't you reply to emails? Uh, yeah. so, um, so, so you got like huge attention and, and one of the greatest investors, Kosla, you know, you had no time for him and he had to join you on a kind of ride to airport. So uh, the demand was huge. The demand was huge, yeah. I, it was happy to see that, uh, that it's all about timing and momentum. And if you have the right timing and the need for the service, because the market is so growing at the moment, and, uh, and when you have the feeling that you have now the product market fit and you really have to work hard at, to get already customer support and salespeople on board. And, and yeah, it's a great feeling, but a lot of work. So, <laughs> so I actually know we are your round valuation, I will not tell. But do you feel like sometimes it's like too crazy? Uh, I believe that you can do so many things uh, with one day. Then imagine how many things you can do with a week. And then think again about the half a year. So yeah, I, I, I'm happy about it. And it's, uh, it's a great Great responsibility as well. <laughs> Key advice to startups about Y Combinator, how to get in? Um, you have to apply. Okay, that's a good one. <laughs> and another one is just, just give your best. It's like they told us as well, like you guys as Stonians should never give up. And <laughs> just <laughs> give your best there. Do we have one question from audience to Karel? He don't reveal the investor names and, and valuation yet, but okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi everyone. My name is Risto, and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Insley. I'm talking about insurance and technology. About uh, myself, then I entered the insurance space like 20 years ago, and for some reason I have stayed there ever since. I have created many insurance-related startups. Uh, some are very successful, some are still looking for their product market fit. Today I'm going to talk about Inslee. Um, 
all the time when I have been in insurance, I have actually never much cared about insurance. It has always about simplicity of that. I, I'm very convinced that insurance should be simple. It should be simple for the customer, because then we can sell them more. And it should be also simple for the insurance companies, because that helps to decrease their costs. But that's not uh, the case today. Insurance is very complicated. Uh, why? Um, because uh, there are two reasons. Uh, insurance companies are very big. They are not really able to innovate. Secondly, there are a lot of brokers, agents. They are very small. They are all able to innovate. Uh, but they don't control the product. Product is controlled by the insurance companies. And you really cannot do much when you don't control the products. And they don't have also the technology. Um, so insurance is in this kind of catch-22 situation, and it's not able to change. In, ad in addition to that, it's strongly protected by regulation. Uh, you cannot enter the business easily. So insurance companies feel safe and secure. Uh, we are going to change that. We will digitalize all insurance sales and policy administration process. We will help small ones, agents and brokers, with a technology that they are not able to do themselves. And we will also help insurance companies. Because uh, smart insurance companies have understood that their problem is speed and agility. With, uh, with our technology, insurance companies can launch products much more quickly and become more agile. What is their problem? <laughs> I'm not going to make the product demo, but in a nutshell, it will digitalize all insurance sales. It is a CRM functionality. It does all the policy administration, invoicing, accounting, renewal management claims. It kind of digitalizes all of the process that anyone who is selling or administrating insurance policies uh, needs to do. We have today around 200 customers from uh, 40 different countries. Among them are 20 MJs. MJs are uh, managing general agents. They are like insurance companies, but actually operating as, as, as intermediaries. And we have already signed up our first insurance company customers as well. Today we are making 170,000 uh, revenues in each uh, month. And, and the good thing that we don't have no churn. Our product is very sticky because it's like a backbone of, uh, of the company. And you don't change your backbone pretty, pretty often. Um, uh, we just closed our funding round of 2 million euros, uh, led by Concentric from UK and Black Pearls from Poland. These are also our target markets where we are selling, and also London Co-Investment Fund and some other small investors participated. So, we are doing okay, uh, but as I'm not pitching here today, so uh, I was encouraged to talk about uh, challenges as well, and I like to talk about them because maybe someone can help me. Uh, in that. Uh, our sales is going on pretty okay, because there is a lot of demand for uh, the technology. Uh, but regardless of that, we can only grow today, let's say, 70-80% a year, our ARR. It's good, but that's not enough to build unicorns. And we, in Estonia, we do unicorns here, so there are many of them. Uh, uh, why? Because uh, when we sell to the big customers, there are is that we need to implement their products as well. Uh, by implementing products, I mean like rating engine, document templates, all that kind of stuff. And it takes time, and it also uh, creates certain stress to the organization when you need to work. Uh, and uh, second uh, thing why we, are, we would like to move more quickly, but we can, is when we launch new countries, when we start selling our product on a retail market, let's say in Poland, in Germany, then we need to do some country-specific localization. And uh, again, that needs, first of all, understanding what are the differences in uh, Poland, for example, uh, compared to Germany, and then also implementing these things and creating local sales team. Uh, my, my dream would, 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 would have like as good geographical expansion plan as Taxify Estonian one has. They, they can launch cities without visiting the, each of the cities. We haven't figured that out yet, so we, we really need to work hard to launch uh, new countries. Uh, the good thing is that 
I think we know quite well what needs to be done to solve these obstacles and uh, start growing like 400% a year what is, what is needed. But, you know, uh, we need to work on that. Uh, and uh, the last thing that I, because I'm, I'm really thinking big and uh, uh, I want, would like to introduce you one new spin-off from the startup. Uh, we, we are launching uh, also the project called Black Insurance. And that's, uh, that is going to replace insurance companies, as we know them today. We will uh, tokenize insurance risk. We will connect capital directly with brokers. I don't have time to explain that, but you can visit uh, the website and read about that. I am very excited about that. I, I think that's the biggest project in insurance made during the last 400 years, after, after maybe Lloyds of London. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, you have been in insurance literally since childhood, so... But now, if you look at the kind of Inslee story, and, and you're looking, you know, you had challenges, you were very transparent to ask advice and so on. If you look back, do you have advice on what to do differently? If you, if you look back, like, were there any mistakes you did, and, and right now you know you won't do it again? No. Wow. Uh, all right, let's say... Um, wait, wait. In, in, in Inslee, let's say, I haven't figured out yet. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, say if, if I would have known, I would have... In, Inslee history is not so long, like, let's say, two or three years. Uh, um, for example, how, how do you make small, sure? Small ones, small ones, but not, not something like that. I would say, you know, that was really the big, mm. big mistakes. Uh, maybe, maybe one mistake, uh, what we, now we, when we have more money, it's easier to recruit smarter people. And, and this is what I wanted to actually ask. How do you know that you have, like, tier one people on board? That this is the kind of global best what you can get? Um, you understand it in a way that uh, when you have that right per person, then you know that that's the right person. Uh, but when you don't know that, then most likely that's wrong. When you are not sure that he's the right person, then uh, most likely he is not. But nowadays, it's pretty busy. Labor market is quite you know, screwed up nowadays. So usually they fire themselves quite quickly. Mm. <laughs> so okay. they, because they leave. If they don't perform, then they usually uh, quit themselves because they they find a pretty easily new job. So it's, uh, uh, you don't need to fire many people uh, because they just understand themselves that they are not right for that job. Great. We have one question here. Uh, can we have a microphone? Thanks. Very good microphones. <laughs> my name is Alex Quinn, a uh, multi-systems company. And, uh, my question is, uh, how quickly and cheaply to attract customers? Uh, as we have two types of the customers, when we are selling to say insurance companies and MGAs who are bigger customers, for them the sales cycle is quite long. So it's from let's say half a year, but sometimes it even goes over a year or two. Um, but when you have the pipeline, that's not a big problem. Uh, when we are selling to small agents, let's say what we do in Poland, we have uh, uh, then we are able to close customers within uh, weeks because. It's exactly the same product goes for everyone. And, and, uh, uh, and from the cost point of view, for us to have one big customer, it's around uh, I'd say 5,000 uh, when we divide our costs by the number of deals. For the smaller customer, it's like a few hundred per customer is our customer acquisition cost. Any other questions? There is one. Last one. Um, my question is, you said that you guys have no churn and you don't even measure it. Um, what makes you sticky? How are you sticky? How do you not have churn? Because uh, uh, Inslee is not some kind of efficiency tool. Inslee, when a company starts using Inslee, 
then all the customers, all the policies, all the invoices, uh, like all the claims are in our system. Uh, so it's, uh, if, we, if we really don't do something extremely bad, uh, and we don't do that, then uh, it's, uh, they are bought in so heavily and uh, that's just very difficult to uh, stop using uh, our software. Okay. Thank you, Risto. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Siim Maivel. I'm the founder of Investly. Investly is a pan-European invo invoice finance marketplace. So with our marketplace, we're helping uh, growing businesses uh, with their working capital needs. And it's quite a steep issue because businesses usually fail because either one of two reasons, either they lack of sales or they have poor cash flow to support that sales. As a comparison to paint the picture, uh, our customers are usually doubling their turnover every year which means that they've invested all of their internal funds uh, to buy stock, uh, uh, take on new business, and make best use of the demand that's coming through the door. But if you're growing at such rates, uh, you, uh, your pockets aren't, uh, you know, there's limits to the depth of your pockets, so a lot of those companies need to use external financing. Um, more than half of our customers have never used invoice financing before because A, it's either not been available to them, or B, it's complicated and costly enough that it doesn't make sense for them. Uh, give an example, uh, Matt and Benz, award-winning fudge producer out of uh, Wales. Uh, they got picked up by Marks and Spencers, who said that, okay, uh, uh, customers seem to love your uh, sweets. We'd like to sell them in 200 Marks and Spencer stores across UK and Ireland. Um, they're a small business. Uh, for them to take on such a challenge, uh, they need external financing because uh, uh, not only will Marks and Spencers buy a lot of goods from you, they will also say that even when you deliver the goods, uh, we will pay you in 45 days' time because that's uh, the policy that they have with the suppliers. Uh, so, 45 days seems a uh, short period, but uh, when you need to d satisfy that demand, uh, you need to pay salaries, your suppliers, uh, maybe hire more staff, you can w wait 45 days. Uh, and if you, if you don't have internal financing, you're not growing as fast as you should, or you're not growing as fast as your competitors are who have that financing. So, Matt and Benz came to us because we have a simple business model, uh, it's a transparent pricing, there's only one discount fee, uh, and there's no reserves that are usually there uh, for more sophisticated uh, banking customers. Uh, it's also easy to use on an online platform. We're in, at the tech conference, so uh, no need to dig deeper there. Uh, and customers also value speed, because when you go to traditional financing providers, you usually get stuck to a four to six week application process and which may or may not result in a positive uh, decision at the end of it. And also, when you get stuck, we have an amazing support team that will help you uh, guide through the journey. So, business is good. It's okay for a startup. Uh, um, this is uh, our yearly, let's say, lending volume in Estonia. Uh, also, we're, we're trading in UK and Estonia, uh, hence pan-European. Uh, but as a comparison, uh, the overall factoring market in Estonia is quite big. It's much bigger in the UK, and it's galactic on a European level. Um, so, large opportunities attract competition. Uh, and where competition has led us is that, especially in the UK, there are a lot of small brick-and-mortar financing providers um, who have strong relationships, but uh, they made this uh, service quite sophisticated and complicated um, because uh, they're competing with others and they sometimes need to hide their costs, sometimes they need to uh, play some tricks on you. Um, 
as a result, uh, there's been another uh, need emerging on the market, because when you're a business owner, um, and you know it's, uh, you know, there's a very, uh, there are groups of very smart, educated people trying to maybe guide you into deals that uh, you're not, not aware of completely, they turn to financial advisors and brokers who will help them navigate in the right uh, financial solutions. But they all need to get paid as well. So as a result, we have very high customer acquisition costs across the industry, mostly in, uh, in, in all of the markets. Uh, and there's also a long sales cycle because of the application process and the lack of uh, alternatives and such. Uh, so, uh, what to do next? Uh, this high customer's acquisition cost has to be paid either by the customer, and this is a visual interface how you're paying that cost. Uh, the pricing is sometimes very complex, you're not aware of what you're paying for actually. Or it's paid by VCs who fuel that uh, growth engine and throwing money at it at all costs. Uh, as a disclaimer, Karma is not invested in us. Uh, so, uh, we were tackling that problem for quite a while and trying to understand uh, the market is very scattered, there's a lot of players out there, uh, but how to reach a significant market size because uh, uh, the ambitions are very high. And we figured out that actually we know we have a great product, we, uh, customers tell us that, uh, we can process the transactions very efficiently, um, and we love building that product and improving that service. But we don't like paying half of our uh, incomes or the funds that we raise to Facebook, Google, uh, and introducers for advertising. So uh, what we've decided to do instead is work with partners our customers already trust, uh, which are banks, other financing providers, who might not serve that target uh, segment that we are serving ourselves. For example, the large uh, uh, international and, and, and British banks uh, such as these. So we tried uh, approaching them a couple of years back, saying that you know it's a win-win deal. Uh, you get to keep the customer. We will serve your customer in partnership, give you a share of fee revenue and uh, we can graduate your customer up to the next products uh, that you might want to offer to them. But two years back, uh, there were different priorities and different object uh, objectives. But things started to change with open banking. So for those of you who don't know what open banking is, it's essentially free movement of financial services. So if you want to, for example, if you're a customer of Bar Barclays and want to sign up with Investly, all you have to do now is similarly how you would open up an account with a recruiting app where you create your account with your Google account, for example. You can open up an account on Investly with your Barclays account. Uh, you will tell us the data you will get access to, and we will pull that data as part of your onboarding automatically via the open banking uh, API. So. I, as a consumer, can now freely roam around and use different financial services providers, and no one can sort of hold me back. And some of the more forward-looking banks have started to understand that if they don't do anything, uh, then they will face a very heavy competition from all the fintechs and from all the other banks as well. Um, and they started to become interested in, actually, how can we collaborate? So. Uh, Things started to change for us as well when a couple of months back we reignited those uh, discussions and we figured out that we can actually serve the bank's customers in partnership. And uh, today we have uh, already, uh, we've built the integrations with all the major uh, banks in the UK uh, and now are negotiating the referral deals and we already have two positive board member decisions from uh, uh, large uh, regional banks in this uh, part of Europe. So this was our challenge. This was how we faced it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for one question. I will be asked it. So that's very good. 
Um, your product is actually like super useful for your customers. The demand should really kill you, literally. And sometimes people like don't do what's obvious, what's useful. What's your thinking? Why is it so? Uh... When you talk to your customers, you know, potential customers and so on. So, so there's two things. One that I touched very briefly on, which was the sale, uh, length of the sales cycle. Hmm. So it's very useful, but bif businesses have very different needs. So hmm. uh, some say that, OK, we'd like to use it, but in December. So we have to make money until December. Uh, so even if we would invest 10 million into marketing today, we wouldn't get 100 customers tomorrow because of the nature of that business. The second thing is a lot of these uh, businesses are not even aware of uh, these solutions because historically existing providers haven't been offering it to the customer segment that we're serving. Um, and this is where uh, we're making an impact through marketing and communications in creating that awareness together with other competitors as well. Yeah. Right decisions don't, don't come always fast. VCs know it. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Tere, Lavas, Bonjour, uh, Hola, Konnichiwa, uh, Namaste, and Nihao, and many hellos to any, uh, many different languages. Šiandien nusprendžiau kalbėt lietuviškai ir patikrinti iš tikrųjų, kiek žmonių yra čia, kurie supranta lietuvių kalbą. Turim, gerai. Uh, so, as the group is quite small, I will switch to English, and it's fine, guys. Uh, a lot of people uh, around the world in the millions of events feel the same way as you just did in, in the beginning, uh, because 75% of the world's population doesn't speak English, and I'm wondering if I'm using the right remote. Uh, so, there are a lot of challenges, right? Uh, uh, because you need to interpret uh, or translate your material so more people could attend your event, uh, could understand your sales pitch, would understand your uh, training materials, and so on. So the uh, translation uh, or language industry is around $43 billion every year and continues to grow because you need to localize your website, uh, you need to translate your uh, sales materials or uh, instructions. Um, at live events, you need to interpret uh, your messages so this is the industry continues to grow. And as we know uh, uh, what it means, right? So if you want to get to the new market, you need to have translation or interpretation. Uh, yes, finally. <laughs> so, uh, well, so translation uh, means growth for your company. And uh, as we know already, uh, Asia is growing significantly. India is growing significantly. Uh, and they don't necessarily speak English, which we assume in the startup world that everyone understands. It's not true. Um, so uh, if you want to reach that market, you need uh, the interpretation. I was surprised that even in the United States, uh, by 2020, most dominant language will be Spanish. So guess how many people will need interpretation in order to communicate with their peer citizens or co-workers uh, at their work. So we at Interactio, we go to live events. So, and currently at live events, you need to do something like this. How many of you use the interpretation equipment in one way or another? Not too many. You go to many, too, too many startup events. Uh, but in, uh, in other scenarios, there are way more people. Uh, so since you don't understand what's, happen, uh, what's happening, there's a, a lot of equipment involved, right? So you need the booth to build in. You need to ship uh, or fly in the interpreter. Uh, you need to distribute receivers. So there are a lot of costs and overhead involved just for, you, uh, for the organizer to provide interpretation. Uh, so what we saw uh, as a problem that all of this is unnecessary, and a lot of people are left, like you at the beginning, misunderstanding or misinterpreting what did you say. So if you have sales organization around the world, when you do the training, I don't think you want, them, uh, you want your people to misinterpret what you say. You want them to understand clearly uh, 
your message. So uh, we made a mobile solution where uh, the speakers here are online. Interpreter can be anywhere in the world. So we can get the best interpreter from any location uh, on good price, because you don't need to pay uh, for their hotels and flights. And then we stream that interpretation back to you over Wi-Fi, mobile data, or even call in. Uh, so you choose the, the best channel for you. Uh, at the same time, we minimize the risk. What if something will happen with the Wi-Fi or internet? Uh, so it looks way better. Um, funny or not, but the slides are the, the same. But this is how it looks like, right? So uh, people understand their mobile phone. They use it 24-7. So uh, it's easier for them to use their own device rather than taking something that was invented 80 years ago and didn't really change since Nuremberg trials. Uh, so uh, people are way happier, right? They, they, have, uh, uh, they, they have their phone, their headphones, and uh, you know, the quality of sound is better. So we're doing now really great. Uh, so uh, last year, at the second part of the year, we introduced SaaS pricing. And our uh, subscription revenue grew by 1,300%. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, but most importantly, uh, thank you, Lithuanians, for support. Uh, but most importantly, we've done 1,600 events. You're thinking, is it a big number or not? Uh, Average audiovisual company that rents equipment makes 10 events per month or so, and that's a good month. We're doing currently around 200 to 250 events a month in 30 countries uh, that are using our solution. Uh, for me, the most inspiring thing is that we work with corporate, we work with uh, event organizers, audiovisual companies, and we work also with churches. So whenever I visit the churches that use our solution, people come crying and hugging me because we're literally uh, changing their lives. We save people from suicides because they were disconnected from the community. We're saving marriages. <laughs> and uh, we're bringing the, the message in your language that you understand. So I'm very excited uh, in, in what we're doing. Um, here, uh, we're already working with the major corporations like Microsoft. We're global partners with TED Talks. Uh, so we're doing their events around the world. We're also onboarding uh, com pharmaceutical companies like Bayer. Uh, we're talking with Mitsubishi. Uh, we have great success with multi-level marketing companies because their main business is events. Uh, so there are a lot of recognition. Uh, we interpreted Tony Robbins, uh, Brian Tracy. Last week, we've done uh, John Belford, The Wolf of Wall Street. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this guy. Uh, so we've done so many speakers. And uh, what is interesting, uh, and there's no slide here, but we, we've done, uh, last year we collected 26,000 hours of interpretation, uh, which allows us to actually then put that into uh, automated translation later on. Uh, so the more events we do, the more content we have, the better interpretation will become in the world. So, uh, you can see free founders. Uh, we started like four years ago with different solution, but uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, now we have 17 people, raised close to 700,000 euros of investment from, from Kima, Change Ventures, and Practica. Uh, great people on the board. I will finish because I know we, we, we have to be done. So uh, if there are any sales reps, please contact me. We will continue to grow. and. Uh, if you have any questions, please come and chat, and we'll chat with Ma Marcus a little bit. Thank sure. you. <laughs> awesome traction. Yes. Um, but you know, startups look always for new market, vertic market verticals, and, and you said you're saving marriages. Yes. It's a huge market. Exactly. Unfortunately, half of them split up. Exactly. This is so. What we try to do now, we come early on during the. Ex marriage, like uh, during the wedding. So we do inter interpretation during the wedding, so people are on the same page what they're committing to. OK. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> which one of them should be paying customer? Uh, it depends on the structure of, of the family. Uh, wow, OK. <laughs> some of them do joint accounts, some of them uh, pay individually, you know. Depends. Yeah, yeah. 
But are you afraid of any future technology trends? Like, you know, talking to each other and understanding each other. It's like so old school, like there is so much lost in translation. Exactly. What if brain to brain communication will kick in? We yes. understand each other without words. This is exciting, and this is where I'm looking forward. Wow. Uh, and this is where, like, imagine if we could speak, you know, I could speak in Lithuanian, you can speak in Estonian, and then uh, whoever speaks Japanese could join. And there are certain expressions that could uh, be better in Lithuanian, in Japanese, or other. Like, uh, so this is a very exciting. And we have all the content, original content. We have professional interpreters doing interpretation. So we have all this data. Uh, even Google doesn't have it. Now they know who has it. So. Awesome. <laughs> OK, one question. Um, there was firstly hand up there. So but oh, but he was actually <laughs> raising even uh, during the presentation. But it's okay, okay. Can I have Mike over there? You can ask after. Uh, individual. In Boom. Hi. Hi. So um, you talked about not like most of many countries, people don't speak English. Yeah. But there are a lot of countries where Wi-Fi and 3G and 4G is really bad. Like where I come from, Brazil is like it's really bad. Yeah. So how do you expect people to tune into your app to listen to the interpretations? Call in. Call in? Yeah, uh, dial the number, connect with the interpreter, and listen uh, through that. But uh, now a lot of organizers are investing in Wi-Fi, so it becomes cheaper. So uh, so it's uh, not a problem. And we have partners in Brazil, and we did plenty of events. We didn't have any issue. So uh, if that's an issue. You can call in because in most places you can do that. If not, we can set up the Wi-Fi like through the partners, and it will be uh, fine. Depends on the budget of the uh, organization. All right. Sounds awesome. Good. Little question. Yeah. Uh, we are out of time. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. You know, this stage is way too big for a former software engineer like myself. But anyway. Um, to some of you, um, our slogan, we make robots behave, might sound a little bit offensive, as if, we, as if I'm suggesting that your robots are uh, kind of naughty machines that have to be tamed uh, or um, um, domesticated somehow. Uh, but in fact, that's exactly what I mean, uh, because otherwise, why those poor guys live in... Uh, are in cages to this day. Um, uh, modern robots have to be, um, uh, they might be pretty fast, strong, and uh, extremely precise, but what they lack is actually uh, something that we call uh, human-like compliance. And compliance is some sort of intelligence, um, uh, the kind of intelligence that uh, depends heavily on environmental perception. And that's exactly where uh, Rubedos enters the picture. Um, um, I share a vision with uh, John Olson, uh, who is uh, one of uh, directors at NASA. And uh, when he says that uh, the future robots will, um, the future robots will uh, operate both in space and on Earth, and not as replacements to humans, but actually as their companions who will uh, carry out the key supporting roles. Um, that means the robots and humans are complementary to each other, and I fully subscribe to this message. Actually, they are as complementary as dogs used to be um, 17,000 years ago when they were first domesticated. Speaking of dogs, um, at Rubedos we like to say that dogs, uh, uh, they are known as man's best friend, but I say that robot is next man's best friend, and uh, I don't know exactly when this switch will happen, but it will, uh, I can assure you, and I have a sneaking suspicion that it, it will be probably sooner than later, and much sooner than some of you in this hall would expect. It's basically the only missing link is lacking, and this is a lack of visual perception. 
And uh, the lack of visual perception is really slowing us down because the future robots will depend heavily on, on the ability to acquire, organize, and interpret the surrounding visual data in order to act adequately and, first of all, safely. And Roberto's answer to this um, need is a system that we informally call just uh, a bolt-on set of eyes, but of course there is more to it than just eyes. Um, speaking in biological terms, um, eyes is just a sensor, that, and it takes the so-called uh, occipital lobe at the back of your head to, um, to interpret what eyes see and to um, provide insights for, for the rest of the brain. And this guy uh, is composed both of both parts, the sensing part and the interpretation part, which makes it locally intelligent, and it can bring local intelligence to otherwise uh, not very smart robot. Now you will say that, OK, this is all uh, roses and puppies, but, but how the hell you would say, uh, sell uh, the technology, which is um, useless per se, un unless you are able to somehow address the, the real end user, uh, end user problem. And uh, you are right. So we uh, basically following this recipe here that we would typically identify the, the application that uh, we think is a, a good fit for perception enhancement. Then we approach the manufacturer, the solution provider, um, and uh, demonstrate how, how perception um, enhances the, its existing product and make, makes it far more competitive. And in return, we would ask um, um, a part of um, like an access to his uh, market uh, distribution chain. And it might sound like a lot, but if you can uh, make it win-win, it, it works. It worked several times already. Uh, needless to say that there are nearly infinite uh, amount of application scenarios which would, could benefit from uh, application of uh, visual perception. And uh, there is no chance that we can cover them all. So uh, having looked into a number of them in terms of uh, value proposition, we uh, focused on this time on manufacturing and intra-warehouse logistics needs, um, honing software to those needs. But uh, the standard product uh, is uh, also available um, to uh, third-party developers uh, through the system development kit that they can use to build their own smart robotic applications. OK, so my time is, is, is getting low. So um, this is one example of, of one of the first our customers. And it might look far-fetched, something different that I've just told, but actually uh, this is the same uh, perception. The only uh, difference here uh, is um, uh, the sensing part. Instead of uh, optical stereo sensing, uh, the computer tomographer is used uh, and x-ray volume image is taken, so the, the sensor is x-ray based rather than optical. But other than that, then it's a, a clinical workflow um, that uses the, the x-ray volume image to locate the tumor so that the tumor can be treated using the um, radiation beam. And Electa, our customer, is the second largest uh, uh, image-guided radio uh, radiation therapy equipment manufacturer in the world. It's a successful uh, commercial product approaching 1,000 installations with uh, 400,000 euros per instance. Um, That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I grab the bottle now? Sure. Um, you know, last year, all the entrepreneurs were so passionate to tell their stories, and this year as well. Last year, we ran like 30 minutes over time, and organizers learned their lesson. So now they don't allow any more questions than one from me. So um, you said something. Um, 
uh, it actually sounded pretty dangerous. Robots are becoming our friends. And some people are saying they first become our friends and then they will take over. Like, do you feel like you are part of it, creating that so situation I'm to happen? <laughs> You're biased. Yeah. But do you believe that you as human will be always superior over robots? Or you think at one point of time they will take over? You see, uh, I think we just don't have the choice because um, I truly believe that robots and humans are really complementary. They have their strengths and weaknesses at completely different areas, and when you put them together, there is a, a, a sum of parts is bigger than, than each of them. And uh, that's, that's the, the recipe for success. It's, uh, it's like a low-hanging fruit, and why, why not pick it up? And um, Well, like uh, it is the case with every technology the human has created. Let's start with the, I don't know, dynamite or something. You can use it in, in both ways, uh, <clears> peaceful <throat> and, and dangerous ways, and uh, the ro robotics is no exception, but, but it can enhance uh, our lives. We just have to accept it. So, as I say, we have no choice, I think. Okay, <laughs> great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rolands. I'm the co-founder of Nordigan, and we're building the credit bureau of the future. Um, and we're doing this, um, doing this uh, for an era that will be dominated by open banking. And Seem gave a very good introduction to what open banking is, so I'll skip that part. But I'll tell you why we're doing this. <clears throat> it might seem that uh, the, the fintech space is already pretty crowded, especially when we're t talking about credit. But, um, but credit is very important. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons to dig deeper into, that, uh, in, into this topic. Um, access to credit is everything. It's extremely important. If we did not have access to credit, we would not be able to afford um, expensive stuff like homes, apartments, cars. Uh, we would not be able to have capital to grow businesses. And um, most importantly, we would not be able to feel safe. Um, right now, the, the, the feeling of um, you know, the fact that you're able to have access to capital whenever you need it, uh, access to credit, credit cards. Uh, this uh, feeling is uh, often taken for granted um, by a lot of us. There's, um, uh, there's a lot of um, headspace that we have because you know, we know we might have access to credit anytime we want. Uh, it gives us a lot of, um, a lot of um, headspace to, to think about the future in a rational um, and, and um, forward-thinking way. Uh, but for a lot of people, this is actually not the case. In fact, globally, uh, banks reject about 90% of all loan applicants, and they are not that happy about this either. It's not pl pleasure in any way to reject so many people. But uh, the reason why they reject so many loan applicants is that uh, they don't have enough data to prove that people are creditworthy. And when they don't have enough data, they turn to the next best thing, which is the credit bureaus. The credit bureaus um, is... Um, historically been that, that entity that uh, allows banks to verify a loan applicant um, who, about whom they have no information. But honestly, credit bureaus are not that much better either. In fact, uh, globally, only 30% of people have some kind of credit report uh, or a credit record with a credit bureau. Uh, most of the people don't have any records. Most of the people don't have any formal credit history. And if you don't have this credit history, you're very unlikely to get access to credit. Now, the good thing is that there's an alternative data source which would allow banks to potentially learn about twice as many people, which is the bank accounts. And then the open banking, a movement that would allow banks to get access to account information seamlessly without friction. Um, so what we're doing right now is helping banks get into that direction. And in particular, we're helping banks to use the account information, this abundance of data, to, um, uh, to actually verify customer income. And income, as you probably are very well aware, is uh, the main uh, factor when evaluating the credit worthiness of someone. Uh, and this is the information that credit bureaus don't have, have never had it. So for the last 50 years, no credit bureau has been able to have any income information. They've made these proxies for income. So the, the credit bureau of the past is um, a company that had some information and uh, uh, did not have a lot of information. The credit bureau of the future is a, operates in an area where there's an abundance of information and what it provides is insights. 
and this is why we built Nordigan. Nordigan is an engine that allows banks to turn account inf information into um, understandable, comprehensible credit reports. Uh, what we work with on a daily basis is uh, uh, bank account transaction data. We, uh, we build sophisticated, smart algorithms to figure out what's the purpose of those transactions, what is the actual account usage behavior, and how that correlates to risk. And then we help banks to use that information to evaluate credit worthiness. Um, from, from the process perspective, it's actually very simple and very, uh, very sort of uh, easy to, to understand. Uh, for example, when a person applies for a loan, they, they visit the lender's website, the bank's website, uh, they give consent to, to get, uh, for the bank to get access to the uh, customer's account information. In the background, our algorithms are used to evaluate the credit worthiness of the loan applicants and, um, and we create a report. And then bank gets that report makes a quick decision, and the decision is uh, positive. Uh, we've invested about three years uh, to uh, uh, do back and forth tests with different banks across 12 countries. We've, uh, we've you know, tried to dig d deep into this as much as we can. I'm not going to talk about the uh, KPIs that we've reached because there's this very uh, advanced statistics stuff, but uh, end of the day, uh, what we have proven to, to be able to do is to approve more loans, to help banks decrease losses, and to eventually offer better rates to the good customers. And um, all of this contributes to access to credit, more access to credit for people that uh, need this and are credit worthy. Um, but that's not where we want to stop. Credit is not the only thing. It starts with credit because it's a very painful topic, but our big ambition is that same technology that we're building right now can be applicable for more than just that. And one of the applications is rent, uh, where we've seen that uh, there's a lot of barriers and the cost of renting out um, expensive assets like cars, apartments, uh, um, and any other expensive assets. There, there are a lot of barriers to that, and our solution could be used to lower the price, perhaps lower the insurance premiums and those as well, so the market is much, much bigger than just loans. Um, how far we are? Right now, we're, we're based in Riga. Uh, we're 20 people. We have gathered this team of extraordinary smart people that I'm very proud of. Uh, we've raised 250,000 euros. Uh, we're planning to end the year this year with 750,000 euros in revenue. Uh, from one side, we're embracing this startup culture where we've graduates from Google Demo Day. Um, so we, we got really cool hoodies from, from Google Demo Day that we're still wearing today. Uh, from the other side, we're ISO certified, so we are, uh, we're embracing all things uh, enterprise. Um, yeah, and so about a couple of challenges, uh, if I may. Uh, right now, we're in the middle of a fundraising round, uh, raising from uh, in somewhere in between uh, 500,000 and up to 1 million euros. So if you know any cool investors that we should talk to that understand our uh, area of operation, uh, do let us know. And uh, we're also hiring a head of sales. So if you have a um, friend that might have a very good fit with what we're doing and, and someone who has sell, sold to banks, also do let us know. Um, that is it from my side. Thank you so much. This is Nordigan. Thanks. Thank you. So, so, you know, banks are big. They have a lot of money. They know their customers and so on. How did you come up with the idea that you have still something to give them so that they could do their business better? Yeah. Actually, uh, my co-founder, he used to work for a financial institution, and um, he, uh, he himself was building the risk team, and he was able to automate all of the things inside the risk assessment except for analyzing bank statements. And then we asked around, it turns out that when we started in 2015, everyone was uh, analyzing bank statements manually in all the banks, and even the large, largest banks. So that the, that's where the idea came from, and we just started, you know, kick, kicked off after, after that. Mm -hmm. You know, China is, um, is trying out scoring every citizen. Yeah. You know, it, it sounds scary. It is scary, you don't pay yeah. your parking ticket, or you get like parking ticket, your score will go down. Like yeah. you misbehave, your score will go down. Yeah, I can't say anything about it. I'm afraid that my score will go down. So no comments on that. But do you believe that what you do will get closer to to the point where we all are scored, or we are anyway? Well, what, what I believe is that there's uh, um, there's we will all be scored to some extent anyway. The, the best thing you can do is try to make that score as objective as you yeah. can. So this is what we're doing. OK, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. 
Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. My name is Piotr, and I come from Riga, Latvia. Uh, from Latvia, we help companies with localization. And um, I wondered whether would you care about localization, but previous uh, uh, speakers were actually, actually Risto from uh, Insloy or Henrikas from uh, Istasio. Uh, they all mentioned localization and translation, which is good. We uh, serve companies uh, from all over the world. We already have 400 paying clients, and we still are not funded, uh, which uh, gives us our questions uh, whether we're doing anything good or not. Uh, we grow 15% every month, and we plan to continue doing this. In terms of companies we serve, it could be anybody. A, a company with two people working on text in their apps, or web or, or other software products, or big companies like uh, you see here Shopify, Vodafone, Bayer. Um, it could be uh, a developer, a digital agency serving their own clients as well. What we actually do, we are in between translators and uh, uh, teams of software engineers, uh, marketing people, product owners, copywriters, and there we, we basically um, go with companies that have a certain flow. They need to have uh, uh, constantly changing um, old features being improved or adding new features or finally adding more languages. Uh, all in all, we believe all over the world there are one million different software teams which needs our product. Um, why do they need us? And this is a good illustration for you and a little joke as well. So imagine the, like today there are like 14 different uh, uh, localization standards, and then there come a, a team, uh, not ours, but somebody else's, and uh, would like to improve it. Then they, like, they work on a universal standard, and eventually the uh, next day we'll have 15 different standards. Uh, this is one of the explanations, but we do more than that. We not only work with like, different localization formats and uh, platforms and uh, frameworks, but we also provide all other localization-related uh, features. And we serve more than 200 of them. And there, uh, we let companies integrate, uh, localize into their development process uh, as fast as uh, in a few hours. And after they've done integration, we take uh, coders or software engineers out of the equation. They're not longer involved uh, with uh, like localization tasks. Uh, thus, they're happy. They don't have this routine to work on. And everybody else is happy because like coders don't uh, say, go away, come in next month. Who are our main competitors? Our main competitors are still Excel spreadsheets and Google Sheets and uh, like and this is really like a shame for any team to use uh, this kind of uh, substitution for for a software platform. Our platform, the, it comes uh, starting with fifty dollars a month, and I believe uh, you pay almost as much for your Microsoft license. Uh, but we provide, as I told you, two hundred different features and uh, more to come. So, like, this is no-brainer for anybody. Another another substitution or surrogate is uh, internal. Uh, dashboards where you make your developers to make a substitution for localize, basically not working on the core product, but instead like creating some utility or a tool uh, for themselves and for others in the team, which is also a waste. So basically, both of these are wasted, and uh, like I suggest everybody to find a tool, either ours or competitors, and move to some real stuff, professional. And this is a good example of uh, one of our clients. Uh, this is like Revolut. They like launched in 2015. Uh, like they added Localize into their development process in September last year, uh, where when they had only two languages. Now they have eight languages, and recently they were funded uh, and valued uh, more than one billion dollars. We're not saying that uh, Localize was uh, like. 
uh, the critical mass for them. But like we've done, we've done a good, good part. And uh, if you talk to like Edward, for instance, here uh, in Revolut, he just loves us. This is basically it. And uh, my only challenge so far with my co-founder is what way should we go? Whether we should uh, actually take some funding and go for like heavy sales-driven company going for enterprises, or instead uh, trying to go through developers and basically educating them through webinars and like some uh, partisan activities, and eventually make them come to the enterprises' bosses and convert them into using a proper translation tool. Thank you. This is it. Thank you. So, so, so maybe I heard a little bit of frustration about fundraising and, and your bootstrap, you're growing well. You have met probably a number of investors. Exactly, yes. What is the feedback from investors? Uh, yeah, they're different. Okay. Like, uh, you can uh, basically find anybody, probably. They're like some experts in something else, which is uh, like, they also get frustrated with me. Okay. But like, some, some are smart people, you know? Okay. <laughs> what is the best feedback you, <laughs> you, know, you have had from smart people? Uh, smart people? Like, don't rush into taking money. Mm. Still grow the company, bootstrap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there's two basic attitudes. Like, take the money, you'll figure out how to spend it, or like, figure out how to spend it and then take the money. I like the second approach. Okay. But if, if you look like further on, who would be the perfect investor for you if you, if you decide to go for it? That's a good question. Uh, this is like... Uh, you have to know what you dream about, right? Yes, yes, exactly. But like for us, like at the moment, it's pretty practical. It's uh, the investor who would, uh, uh, who has the same vision into like being on a mission of uh, growing into one million uh, software teams, not like uh, just like going with a sales team in San Francisco and uh, like going around for enterprises. Yeah. This is like kind of stupid. Okay. And hopefully smart as well. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is Richard Formrats and I'm CEO of Play Engineering Systems. And I will tell you a story and, um, about the most advanced sport technology startup in the Europe. I'm just back from the World Ice Hockey Championship uh, that will take place in Denmark. And I will tell you a bit about the technologies we use there. So, we provide the real-time player, puck, and ball tracking that is based on camera stream video analysis. Uh, so, there are two cameras or four cameras above the field that track the players, the ball, the puck, and provide the output in 1.4 seconds. And Additional cameras on the perimeter, they track the numbers on the player jerseys, and so we stick those data together and generate all the stats and analytics on real time. Even more, we use, uh, we use similar technology to provide fully automated game filming and production that works without any operators. And uh, also many different other things like video refereeing. So this is an example how the coach tablet uh, works in real life, so the coaches are able to use the technologies of level N NBA, NHL, but now they became affordable for the rest of the sport market, thanks to the play engineering systems. So they are able to generate all the stats, analysis, heat maps, video analysis, all that stuff for their own team, own league, federation, and their own sports. So what it comes out of that, so if we compare with the previous year, we doubled the revenues, the profits. Uh, in case we look on the sales leads, we even tripled the sales leads with the customers who said that, yes, they are interested in our solutions, and they will end with the sale in about next months or next years. And uh, if we compare the last year, uh, five months, with these uh, five months in 2018, we made 10 times revenues of the, of the last year at the same time. And what is more, we are self-financing uh, since we 
since we invested all the seed money, so then uh, there are already 12 months we are self-financing and covering our expenses by ourselves. Even more, so it's not only about the coaches, we are already scaling to other, other possibilities. Uh, so International Ice Hockey Federation used our data on our social media during the last Ice Hockey World Championship. Uh, we made the integration with the world's largest uh, media rights holder in front, and so we provided our data on real time during the live broadcasts on the cube in the, both venues where the World Championship proceeds, and of course on the social media, on the websites, and so on. I just called our technology IT genius, and uh, so we made the real entertainment uh, with the stats nobody has seen ever before. And during World uh, U18 Ice Hockey Championship, uh, it, or fully automated game filming was used also as official for the official live stream of all the games. So, so let's uh, take a look so to some other direction instead of ice hockey. What about the basketball and handball we are covering with our technology? Probably you know this brand, you have seen it somewhere. Actually, it's the world third most uh, richest club in the world ever been on this world. And we are doing together. And in the next years, we will see it uh, in, in many, many sport events. So it looks uh, very good. So if we look on our competitors, actually in optical, optical tracking of the players, there are only four competing companies. They're really huge. They have billion valuation. But uh, we reach the same level. We are on the same step with all of those companies. But what is amazing that uh, no, none of them are able to reach our, our target market because we, we are, thanks to our technologies, we are able the, to reach the market that was not reachable ever before. But uh, I will be honest with you that uh, every, we did some mistakes. So it's a, it's a human being and um, I will share, share some of those three mistakes we did by ourselves. First, I am still standing here and this is Europe. I am not somewhere in the States. And um, I would say that European, even we doubled our revenues, but the European sport market is still very conservative. And we should move to the States uh, with, with the most advanced technologies. We should move to the most advanced sport markets uh, already one or two years before. So, but uh, the good news is that we will do this this year. In August, we are opening our branch in the States, in Chicago. So it's better later than not doing at all. The second biggest mistake was that we still haven't cloud solution. So we generate the data in real time, really precise data, really advanced data from every of the venues, but we don't uh, aggregate those data at the moment yet. We are working on that, but that was our mistake that we didn't that already one or two years before. And maybe it's related with the next reason and uh, finishing about that. We just in the, at the end, at first part of this year and end of the last year, we lost two deals for, for about five million euro just because we don't have the data aggregation at the moment. So, and the third, the biggest, um, the biggest mistake of plagiarism is that we, we haven't attracted a round at the moment and we spent 12 months uh, attracting the investment, but uh, 12 months ago, we had some proposal with uh, 9 million valuation and uh, the proposal was not perfect, but it may, I would say it was good. But uh, we decided to take a look on the possibility to attract more. 
and uh, do more. And uh, in that way, we lose a bit of uh, focus on the possibility to scale the company, to work on development of the business. Instead of that, we focus very much on the regular cash flow. But uh, we are now uh, attracting the funding, and uh, that is the third challenge we will solve this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, Estonian ice hockey team is, um, I don't know actually even if it exists, <laughs> but, um, exists. but with your technology, you know, we, we would use it and then train better and so on. How quickly we could win uh, Finns, Finland yeah. in ice hockey? How quick are Finns? There are some Finns in uh, the audience. Uh, <laughs> have, have you kind of measured, um, do you have kind of quantitative measure how quickly teams get better using your technology? So at first, uh, at first, if you aggregate the data, you are able to compare any of the player that is superstar in nowadays, compare what, how he did two or three years ago, and you can compare every player of that the same age with that level, what sh he should do to reach that uh, superstar level. And uh, that is regarding aggregation of the data. In case of uh, instant real-time analysis, there were many and many cases how it was used just to change the strategies during the game, and we saw how it works on the playground. And uh, for example, the player who didn't score, the coach look on the uh, heat map and he understands where is the problem. He changed the location of the player and he starts to score, score, and score. Just a few insights have it and help sports and uh, not only to 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 help the coaches and uh, and the managers but also how to make the entertainment more exciting about the sports yeah we have not talked about exits at all um imagine you got right now phone call okay hi i followed you we'd like to buy your company for 100 million you need to decide now Depends on. Yes or no? 100 yeah. million. <laughs> Depends on, uh, on uh, what... It's money on the yes. table. Depends on what it comes out after. But uh, in general, yes. Okay. These are never easy decisions. Yes. So great. Thank you. Thank you.